praise the Lord. O God, our Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come, Lord God, hid with your Son, and in your Son, and through your Son, and we praise you, Almighty God. You are from everlasting to everlasting. You who opened the Red Sea that your people would walk through on dry land. You who brought water out of a rock. You who fed the nation in the wilderness where there was no economy, Lord, no agriculture, no banks, uh, no shopping center. You fed your people from heaven. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you, Almighty God. And we heard on Wednesday night the testimonies out of our sister, Lord, losing her, her, her card, her bank card, in the hands of strangers, and they couldn't do anything with it. We praise you. We praise you for protection. We praise you. We praise you, Almighty God. And now I come to you, Father. And I thank you for those that are here. And I thank you for being with us. And I thank you for giving us your word. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for taking charge. As I commit everything into your hands, Lord God, you deal with the devils, you deal with the oppressors, you deal with those who come against us, God. I put them to you and you take care of them and we put ourselves in your hands. Help me now, I need your help, Father. And I say thanks in Jesus' name. And Father, I come now, Lord, and I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. And I humble myself before you, knowing that I'm a man and you are God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This was a Kimbrough sandwich prayer. I learned that this morning in Sunday school. Praise. Prayer in the middle, that's the meat. And worship at the end. And I, yes. And I was planning to do this even before all Pastor Simon, all the worship took place. And when I said, when I sat there and I first saw Sister Yvonne, when I saw Sister Yvonne kneel there, I said, I'm going to kneel. And then Pastor came and he kneeled. So the whole trend this morning, there was a thread, there was a thread flowing through of worship. So I had planned this before Pastor came and did this. I really did. Sister Yvonne is the one who started it. And thanks again for your prayer and thanks for your support. Well, I don't know if I can finish this message, but there's so much that I want to say. But um, after the service, if the message is speaking to you and, um, uh, and you feel that there's a need, because I, I want to take us somewhere. I would like you to meet me on the right side in the back, those of you who feel led, so I could cement it some more into you and share some, just for a few minutes, some maybe things that I have experienced that might help you. Because I really want us to move from where we are, like Pastor Simon is talking about a new day coming, a new time. Somebody talked about something new, and I don't want us to be how we have been. So after the service, if you are moved to do that, please, I would appreciate that. So I want to thank you for all the Christmas gifts that I, you have given me, and I come to give you a Christmas gift now. And the message that I want to bring is the first coming of Jesus, the Christmas story. And for our scripture reading, we're going to take it from Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, we're going to read 8 to 14. I know you know the, 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 uh, the story and all of that, but it's good to hear the word of God again. The Bible says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you, O shepherds, is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ 
the Lord, Christ the anointed Messiah. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, in lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. Praising God, saying glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. They were not singing. They were shouting, making noise. And I grew up in church as a child. And in my young days, I knew this scripture. And as a youth, I always wondered what was the noise about. You see, Christianity in my days was terrible. Not terrible, but very hard on young people. I went to Sunday school in the morning, 10 o'clock. I went to church, 11 o'clock. I went to another Sunday school in the afternoon. I couldn't go in the park on Sundays. I couldn't go on the beach. I couldn't do anything. And I was scared of God. I feared God. Not the right fear. Afraid of God. Papa God will punish you. Scared of God. Scared of hell. I lived my life in fear. And I asked myself the question, what was the noise about? Why are they rejoicing? Where is my rejoicing? And the thing about it, all the young people didn't feel like I felt. I was afraid, but some young people, they didn't care. When I was about 12 years old, 12, 13, a young girl came to our house, and she kissed me. Yes, she did. And I didn't know anything about kissing. No, she was two years my junior and 10 years my senior in kissing. I thought you kissed. No, this is serious. Everything I'm saying to you is, is true. Because I tell you, I struggled in the early days. I know about kissing on your cheek and on your forehead. And she kissed me. And I, what is this? What is that? I kind of liked it, but I was scared. I was afraid of God, afraid of hell. And just around that time, they said that Jesus was coming. They, you know, you always have these forecasts. Jesus is coming. There was a special night. And I remember the moon was bright, full moon. And the sky was full of white clouds. And I'm running up to my church to repent. And hoping I got there before Christ would come. Church might have been about, half, about a quarter mile away. And I'm running, and I'm running. I'm scared, just scared of God, scared. That was church. And while I'm running, I look up in the sky and... The, the, the white clouds and the moon, they made a formation. I said, oh God, he's coming. He has him. I looked up and the cloud, the formation. I, I'm telling the truth. I got frightened. And I ran faster to the church. When I got to the church, I was there. And the thing is this. Oh, by the way, it's not my wife I'm talking about. I didn't know her that well. This girl was, my wife was Roman Catholic. This girl was Pentecostal. She was on fire. <laughs> so, I was in the church. And I had to go to the bathroom. And the bathroom is outside of the church. And when you're facing the church, there's a door to the left. You come out of the church on a platform. And then you walk. You turn left and you walk down about three or four flights of stairs. Steps. You walked around and you went to... The bathroom. So I did that, walked down the steps, went to the bathroom, and I'm hurrying to get back to the church. But as I opened the bathroom door to come out, to go back to the church, I heard one of the loudest noises I've ever heard. One terrible noise. I said, oh, God, the trumpet. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. I didn't bother go around to walk up the three or four flights of stairs. I jumped from where I was onto the platform in the church, making sure everybody was there. It turned out that that bang was two cars crashed. And in those days, we didn't have much car crash in, in, on the island because people didn't drive that far. It was a loud noise. I thought it was a trumpet. I'm telling you the amount of fear that I had. And there's a reason why I'm saying that. The fear of hell does not stop you from leaving the church. I say it again. 
fear of hell don't, 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 don't stop you. Because I left the church after a while. I backslid. And God in his mercy, he took me back. And when he took me back, I started to read the word. I started to study. A few years I stayed out. And I came back. And I started to study the word. And then I started to see what the noise was really about. And when we look at the scripture, we saw the angels coming to shepherds. And shepherds were poor, hard-working people. Poor people. And, uh, and Jacob gave us an insight into the life of a shepherd when he worked with his um, father-in-law, Laban. He said, that which was torn of beasts, he's talking about taking care of labor and sheep. That which was torn of beasts, he says, I didn't bring them unto you. I bore the lust of it. My hand did as you, you require it from my hands. Whether stolen by day or stolen by night, they guard the sheep with their, with, 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 with their, with their bodies. Thus I was in the day, the drought consumed me, and the frost by night. And my sleep departed from my eyes. It was hard. They were poor. And God Almighty opened the heavens. Now in the book of Matthew, Matthew loved to talk about kings and three wise men. Now the three wise men, maybe they were scholars. They knew how to study the stars. And they knew the heavens. And they knew all of that. And they had gold and silver and more. But when they came looking for Jesus, they had to search for him. They didn't know where he was. But God revealed himself to the shepherds. He told them where they would find the child. God loves the poor. Jesus says, He lifted up his eyes, the Bible says, to his disciples. And he said, blessed are you poor. He said so. For yours is the kingdom of God. And when he came preaching, the first sermon he preached, he said, the, king, the, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And maybe, and Matthew calls it poor in spirit, but no, the poor, the word used poor there, mean begging, low, poor, really poor. God loves the poor. Jesus loves the poor. He loves the rich because he came for all men. But maybe you are hurting. Maybe you are poor. Maybe you are struggling. Or maybe you know someone who is poor. They have nothing. Let them know that Jesus loves them. Amen. We were poor when we were growing up. Amen. We were poor. But my mother knew that Jesus loved us and loved her. And she knew how to cry to Jesus. My brother told me one morning, he heard her praying. We had nothing in the house. I'm going to say nothing. Not a breadcrumb. Nine children. Nothing. And she was praying. And before the morning was over, a woman whom she worked for walked down the street. Normally a woman will take the bus, but she walked that morning. Called my brother, gave him $5. And in those days, $5 was a lot of money. He could have bought breakfast and lunch and dinner. Amen. We were poor, but God met our needs. And she, my mother was able. My mother was able to send us all to school. We, we, we live well compared to a lot of people. And in my family, in my, among my siblings, we had accountants. We had two nurses. One of my, one of my sisters got to the highest place of being a nurse under the British system. We had teachers. We had accountants. My, 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 sec, my, first, my second brother, he was a doctor, a medical doctor. So we had, we had accountants, nurses, doctors, teachers, and me. <laughs> what was the noise about the first coming of Jesus? You see, the earth was in darkness, if you notice. The Jewish system was coming to an end. In AD 70, the Romans destroyed the temple and scattered the Jews. That was just 70 years after Christ came. The system was coming. The earth was in darkness. And so Jesus had to come through. He said, I am the light of the world. That is what the earth, that is what the, the noise was about. And why did Jesus come? What was it about? The Bible said they were singing glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace and goodwill to men. 
That's what he came for. To give God glory and to give peace and goodwill to men. And sometimes I ask myself the question, even now, is God getting his glory? Do we, or are we enjoying peace and goodwill? Are we fulfilling? Are we, the noise was made at the beginning. Are we keeping this noise going? Is the church glorifying God? Are we the people rejoicing? Are we the people doing the will of God? Are we feeling what they were rejoicing about? And how did God get his glory? There are many examples. But we know that the, that the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, nature has done its part in glorifying God. We have to do our part. And the Bible says in John 9.1, I'm going to read something here. How did God get his glory when Jesus came to earth? The Bible says that as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, 9.3, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now here was a breakthrough. Here was a difference. Jesus is saying plainly, the works of God should be made known, manifest. The works of God should be manifest in him. When he had spoken, uh, going to uh, uh, verse 6, he spat on the ground and he made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the, of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way thereof and washed and came seeing. That is the work of God. Not the blindness. Seeing from blindness. The work of God should be manifested in our lives. Then again, they called the man, and the Jews didn't like that, so they tried to make the man, you know, to say something that, is, that didn't happen. And he said, give God the glory. And they, they, they told the guy, they said, Praise God. What I'm trying to say, God got his glory. Even if they didn't believe in Jesus, they still admit that God was great. They said, praise God. We know that this man is a sinner. But praise God. Give God the praise. And then the blind man answered, he says, since the world began, it was not heard that any man, that is 932 and uh, 33, opened the eyes of one that was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Since the world began, we heard in the Old Testament that Elijah raised the dead, but we never heard of a blind eye being opened. Now that miracle tells us what God does. It gives us the work of God. It tells us why they were shouting and rejoicing, that the kingdom of God came, that we will see a new time, a new era, a new epoch, a new season. That is the word of God. And so, they asked Jesus, who sinned? You know, sometimes we want to blame people. We even blame the devil. We blame, we blame, we blame, we blame. I remember I was sitting with a guy and he put his chair on, 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 a, on, a, on the surface, was wet, and it slipped and he almost fell. And he says, Satan, you're a liar. And I could just hear Satan say, I didn't say anything. <laughs> you know, the thing is this. The Bible says there is no, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He, hear me now. I'm going to use just one example. Because this covers, this blindness, this healing of this blind man covers everything. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, they have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Sometimes we get the feeling that we alone are suffering. You know, somebody will say, you haven't walked in my boots. Somebody told me some time ago, you, know, you just have the, the, the tip of the iceberg. But everybody goes through. You don't know what I'm going through. I don't know what you are going through. But the Bible says there's no temptation given. But such as is common to man, what you are going through is common to man. It is 
As much as you believe it is so deep and great and heavy, it is common to man. And when he said man, he meant sinners as well as saints. I talk to some unsaved people, and they're going through hell. He said, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you will be able to bear it. Now, some people believe that God gives you the temptation and makes a way to escape. No, he doesn't do that. Temptation comes naturally. Problem comes naturally. There are four sources that impact the lives of human beings. Negative as well as positive. God, God don't do the negatives. But God, Satan, nature, and man. God, Satan, nature, and man. And your problems could come from three of them. Satan, man, and nature. Your problems could come from your own self. I have had it happen to me. And one time I was pushing a wheelbarrow with some pebbles. And I slipped on the grass and the whole pebble wheelbarrow fell and the pebble was all over the place. I got angry with God. And I said, God, why did you throw me down? I got angry with God. The thing is, I was wearing a leather shoes in wet grass. I was a fool. And I fell. Don't blame God. Look for the way out. He has provided a way out. The church is a way out. The ministry of the word is a way out. Prayer is a way out. He has given a way out. If he will take it, don't blame God. We're supposed to be delivered. Jesus Christ said, this is the work of God. A man was blind, man. A blind man. Well, let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Jesus went into a city called Nain. And there was a man carried out. He was dead. The only son of his mother. And she was grieving. And Jesus' heart was touched. And he went and he touched the coffin. And he raised that man from the dead. That is the work of God. What was the noise about? That noise is still in the air waiting for us to duplicate the works of Jesus Christ. And if we fail it, we have failed in God. When I consider the price that God paid for our salvation, when I consider that the Son of God came from God himself, and he became a man, and he paid, when I consider the preciousness of the blood of Christ, I'm ask, I ask myself, what am I doing here? What are we doing here? And so Jesus Christ raised the man from the dead. But I'll read you one more. You know all these stories, you know, but you see, these things cause me to make a move in my own spirit. In Luke 13, 11 to 13, the Bible said, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, Thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. God got his glory. She got her peace. 18 years coming in and out of the church. Nothing was happening. Jesus saw her. Jesus is seeing you today, whatever it is that you are bound with. She was bowed over physically. You might be bent over emotionally, financially. He's the same Jesus. And she glorified. We never see sickness glorifying God. It was always the healing, the deliverance. And the ruler of the synagogue objected, objected to that woman's healing because it was on the Sabbath day. And in Luke 13, 15, Jesus, um, the Lord then answered him and said, You hypocrite, doth not each of you on the Sabbath lose his ox, his ass from the stall, and lead him away watering? And verse 16 says, And ought not, and this is the part I want us to get, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound, lo, these 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? 
daughter of Abraham. This is why, why, why I'm reading this story. Those of us who are in the first coming, now we know about the second coming. Because the woman was a daughter of Abraham, Jesus said that she's supposed to be loosed because she was a daughter of Abraham. The Bible says in Galatians 3, 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Are you of faith? Now let us be realistic. Bowing for 18 years, whatever the problems are or the problem is, she was a daughter of Abraham. He's saying, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, that is, they are the, the uh, children of Abraham. And Galatians 3, 9 says, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. I'm trying to go a little faster. Galatians 3, 13 to 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that brings that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Why was Christ made a curse? No answer. Why was the Son of God, the Holy Son of God, made a curse? Exactly. So that the blessing, it's, it's right in the Bible. So that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us. And the other question I want to ask you, was Christ really made a curse? Did it really happen? Do you believe it happened? Yeah. The Bible says it happened. He was made a curse. Curse is everyone that hang on the tree. So if indeed he was made a curse, and indeed the blessing of Abraham has come upon us. Case closed. So let's take a look at Abraham a little bit. The Bible says in Genesis 23, 1, I don't think it's up there. Sarah, Sarah was 100 and, uh, 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of Sarah. And she was 10 years younger than Abraham. Eh? Okay. And Sarah died. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for Sarah. 127 years old. And she died. Abraham would have been 137. And in Genesis 25, 1, at 137 years old, then again, Abraham took a wife. And her name was Keturah. Listen. The Bible says in Psalm 20, uh, 91 verse 16, with long life, shall I satisfy you and show you my salvation. Life is supposed to be long and satisfying. This is the word of God. It might not be our experience. But it is the word of God. And if we say it and we claim it in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the redemption now, it is because of the redemption. The blood is so powerful. Amen. I'll get to that maybe in a little while. Amen. And the Bible says in, in Genesis 25, 5, And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubine Keturah, which Abraham had, the sons of the concubine, which Abraham had, and he didn't adopt them. Eh? You listening to me? 137 years old. You're not getting me. He didn't adopt them. Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward on the, uh, uh, the east country. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life. He lived 100 and three score and fifteen, 175 years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. But before Abraham died, he had a testimony. God was glorified in his life. Not only was he an old and strong, but he was rich. And old age doesn't mean that you have to be sick and falling and dying and, image and all of that stuff. All age simply means a lot of years. It means that you clocked in more than others. That's all. In God's economy, immortality 
is what he desires for his children and his people. Yes, we know we had to finish in this flesh. But you see, sometimes some people bury themselves before they should. So Abraham gave up the ghost. But the Bible says in Genesis 24, 35, when Abraham's servant went to meet uh, a man for his, his, his son, he said, the Lord has blessed my master Abraham greatly. And he has become great. And he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, and men servants, and maid servants, and camels, and asses. Now that woman, that bent over woman was called a daughter of Abraham. I am a son of Abraham. She had a right to be loosed. We too have a right to be loosed. Abraham was not the only example. See, so I can move quickly. We have our friend Moses in Deuteronomy 34, 7. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes was not dim. <clears throat> now his natural force abated. Amen. Would God do better for them than us? We are the children of God. We are accepted in the beloved. We are born again. We are hid, the Bible says, with Christ in God. Would he do better for them than us? Sister Joan has a, man, has a neighbor living just next door to her. He's 101 years this year. I saw him in the street the other day. And there are many more. It is our mentality. It is what we learn. It is what we feel. It is a lack of faith that causes us to go down when we shouldn't. And I'm not saying that I'm a hero, you know. I have problems, eh? But I will get through all of them. I have gotten too much, and I'm going to get through more. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab onto the mountain of Nebo. To the top of Pisgah. Moses. At 120 years old, he's climbing a mountain. And I have a brother. He's very funny. He believes in God. He's a very positive guy. He's even shorter than me. And he, he says, you know, Jerry, he called me the other day. He said, you know, he liked that. He heard a preacher say, you know, Moses went to his own funeral. And he added to it, he said, can you imagine Moses going up the hill? And he said, hey, Moses, where are you going? He said, I'm going to a funeral. He said, whose? He said, mine. They want to know what's happening because Moses went up the hill at 120 years old. And God took him up there. He didn't land on a bed sick. And he died. And nobody knew where, knows where Moses' body was. So what was the noise about? It's to bring peace and goodwill to men. And here is the definition of peace. Security, safety, prosperity, felicity. And felicity means intense happiness. Come on, man. God deserves glory. God deserves praise. He has paid for it. Here is the definition of goodwill. Kindly intent, benevolence, delight, pleasure, Satisfaction toward men. Now on the earth. You, see, you know why I said now on the earth? Jesus said, The thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He says, I am come that they might have life more abundantly, and it's really super abundantly. And sometimes we're waiting for that super abundant life in the hereafter. But you see, if he was talking about the hereafter, what is the thief doing there? Why is he contrasting the thief with him? It is now. Super abundant life. That's what he came to do. That's what the noise was all about. And I was sick and sorrow and hurting and scared, not knowing what the noise was all about. No, it's easy, easy to talk a lot about trials and uh, tribulations, and we do go through that. And we suffer for Jesus. I will suffer for Jesus. I tell people when my wife fret me, I suffer for Jesus sometimes. I don't see anything. I do. You know, we suffer in many different ways. And I love my wife. God knows I love my wife. I wouldn't want to live with anybody else. But if after she's 90 high and I'm 100 low, 
she decided to leave and go to meet Jesus, pick up my phone and I'm texting Ketua. Is Ketua the woman? <laughs> so here's a scripture that we hardly quote. Here's a scripture in Mark 10, 29 to 30. You know, we never quote, I, I hardly ever hear this scripture being quoted to the point where we don't even believe it. Hear what Jesus says in Mark 10, 29 to 30. Jesus answered and said, one of them asked him, Lord, well, what about us, all that we leave, all that we give and suffer for you? And Jesus answered and said, verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel, verse 30, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Hmm? I lose my page. Now, in this time, yes, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and wives, no, not wives, and children and lands with persecutions. And in the world to come, eternal life, he didn't leave out the world to come. But this is it. This is it. And we could enjoy the Lord here. So I'm here to tell you, saints, that sin robbed the human race. But God restored the goodies. John, the greatest prophet, he looked at Jesus after he baptized. After Jesus was baptized, and John declared, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin. He didn't say sins, you know. The sin, singular. That big sin that Adam and Eve did that plummet all of us into darkness and suffering and sickness and all you have it. He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin. The sin. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, if sin was the cause of our problems, if, if, if sin was the cause of our situation, then Jesus is the cure. Jesus is the cure. We could talk about sin, but let's talk about the Son of God. He is the cure. The Bible says in Romans 4.25, He was delivered for our offenses, and He was raised again for our justification. And according to Ephesians 1.7, we the saints, we have redemption. And what is redemption? A releasing or liberation affected by payment of a ransom through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. His blood and redemption leave no room for anything belonging to the fallen state. Nothing. There's nothing that his blood can't do. And the psalmist prophesied in Psalm 118, verses 22 to 24. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day. This is what the noise was about. Let us be glad. And John sent his disciples to Jesus. One day John was in prison. In Luke seven twenty two. And they want to know if he was it. If this was the time, if that was the time, Jesus didn't give them a yes. John said, are, are you the one? Because you see, so many things are happening, like what's happening to us now. And sometimes we wonder, you know, what's happening? And John said, are you the one that should come or do we look for another? Jesus didn't tell him yes. He just said, go your way. Tell John what things you have seen and heard. What are the blind see? The lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor has the gospel preached to them. If they come to us, what can we say? What can we say? What can I say? What can you say? What can the church say? Says, let us rise up, let us start, let us move. There's much more that I can talk about, but this is where I'm going to stop to challenge us. I am moving forward. 
There's a thing that I used to always say, I didn't like Christmas at all because every Christmas I'm broke. That's no joke. This Christmas, when I realized what happened, I said, I stop say that. I'm not going to say it anymore. And I'm serious. I'm a son of Abraham. I'm not a greedy person. I know that. I see people, I want to give, I want to help. I see the guys hanging out by Home Depot waiting for jobs, those guys. My heart goes out. I wish I had money to, sh to give them. We can do it. We can do it if we trust God. We can do it if we change. We can do it if we have faith. Like Pastor Man, I'm finishing. Pastor Man was telling me the other day, you know, God gave Israel all of Canaan. Tell them it's theirs. But they had to fight for it. They had to fight. God didn't tell them to win, you know. He just told them to fight. He was going to win. Well, our fight, saints, is faith. Our fight is faith. Our weapons, like Pastor Kimbo said, is praise and prayer and worship. That is our fight. That is our weapon. And we can do it. And I will do it. And if you're interested, meet me at the back after the service. We'll talk more about that. I'm going forward in the name of Jesus Christ.